good to have you all to join us this evening as we continue to look into the infallible word of God. The Bible clearly tells us, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word have I stored in my soul that I may not sin against you. Sanctify them with your word. For your word is the truth. Let us bow our heads as we ask God to enable us through the ministry of his Holy Spirit as we study his word. And Father God, thank you. We've come back again a week today. Last week, we all assembled in the same manner to study your word. Thank you for extending another week to us that we may do the same. We've come with humble hearts to study your word. And we pray that the same Holy Spirit who authored the scripture will move in our hearts and open us to you. May our study this evening will, may it result in the edification of our souls. And may it cause in the advancement of our spiritual life. May it cost. May it cause in the fulfillment of the plan that you have set before us. Ultimately, may it bring glory and honor to your holy name. And this is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We're back to the study of Hebrews. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. The book of Hebrews. Chapter 2, we're going to be looking into, we're going to look into another aspect. We are flipping the coin. We are flipping the coin of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the one side of the coin is the deity of Jesus Christ, and on the, on the other side is the humanity of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, the author of Hebrews did an excellent job in demonstrating that Jesus Christ is truly God's Son. That Jesus Christ is truly God's Son. That is to say that he is God. That is not an angel. He is not an angel. He is not created being as angels here. We have seen, demonstrated through God himself who called our Lord Jesus Christ God. Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. The angels were created beings. When angels worship, they worship him as we saw in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. He is superior to angels in every sense of the word. Today, the author of Hebrews is going to show us the other side of the deity of Jesus Christ's humanity. And so the glorious humanity of Jesus Christ, if you are looking for a topic, to put on your note in your notebook, the glorious humanity of Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And uh, it is our, our mind, our human mind is so tiny, so finite to comprehend the infinite being. And God is infinite, and we are not. Our mind is so limited to grasp everything about God. So when we look at God, don't forget that God is one. God is one. And that one God represents spirit. John 4, 24, God is spirit. 
is not three spirits one spirit god is spirit who internally exists in three persons this one spirit not three spirits only one spirit but he exists in three persons he he manif he, he exists in the sense that each member that's how god chose in eternity past to function eternity past which means a time way back as we can go and beyond eternity past means has no beginning this god that i'm talking about this evening exists as one and that's why the jews constantly in the old testament on sabbath they will sing they they will they will sing it like chorus shamai israel adonai elohim adonai Ahab. here O israel our god is unique our god is one god is all one god not two gods not three gods even though each member shares the name god god the father god the son god the holy spirit keep in mind they are from one spirit one spirit god one this one spirit god is love so is that aspect the other branch of god the father love so is the other branch of god the son love and so is the other branch of god the holy spirit is love god is sovereign so, so is the father sovereign so is the son sovereign so is the holy spirit sovereign god is immutable so is god the father immutable god is son immutable god is the holy spirit immutable co-equal co-infinite they have personalities which make them unique they all have personalities they function in the division of labor the father is the one who designed the plan and is he is the one in authority the son is the one who fulfilled the plan and the holy spirit is the one who refused the plan to us in this dynamic plan that god set in motion and so jesus christ in his deity is spirit in his deity is spirit but he added human nature and he became god man unique from other members of the triunion god the only person with flesh the only visible member of the triunion god and so that is so important for us to understand if we are going to understand jesus christ as he is revealed in the bible god man fully god fully man in one person undiminished deity for all eternity and so the author of hebrews has done a tremendous work a magnificent work in laying out the foundation that jesus christ is superior to angels that jesus christ is superior in every respect to the to every created being and so we begin in verse 5 of chapter 2 for he did not subject to uh, to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking but one has testified some who are saying what is man that thou rememberest him or the son of man that thou art consigned about him thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels thou hast crowned him with glory and honor and hast appointed him over the works of thy hands 
thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him, but we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For everyone. The author here now is going to is setting is is trying to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is truly human. Truly human. First of all, when it comes to 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 rulership, angels we are not given any authority in terms of rulership. Angels were never called to rule anything. They were not called in any way, in any form to, to rule. So angels were not rulers. But man, man has been given that authority of rulership. And so the author here is telling us about Jesus Christ, who in every sense of the word, has been given this authority of rulership that removes him from the bracket of angelic being. Jesus Christ is not an angelic being. On the contrary, he created, he created them. The Jehovah's Witnesses have come along and thought that Jesus, they believe that Jesus indeed was God rather that he was created and then god jesus created other things that jesus was first created they believe he was they're not arguing that he is god the jewish witnesses don't argue that they believe he's god but that he was created being he was a created god small god and then he turned around and created all things they, they don't argue that he created all things. You see how the devil can maneuver and confuse you. But the problem with that is what Jesus said, I am the alpha, the omega. Alpha is the first letter. If there's alpha, that means there's no letter before alpha. The omega, no letter before omega, the last letter in our alphabet, in the Greek alphabet. And so, Jesus, uh, the, the, Isaiah also tells us about what, what the Lord himself said, beside me, there is no other God. So if Jesus was created, uh, how come the Bible is saying, beside me, there is no other God? In fact, if you believe that, you, be, you, you enter into polit politism, you, believe, you come to a point of believing in pluralism of deity, in other words, multiple gods. And that is falsehood. That is heresy. And so Jesus Christ was not created for his throne, as we have seen in chapter one, was of ancient in eternity past. And John nails that very well in John 1 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. In other words, there was never a time when the word was never with God. In eternity past the word has never left god alone in the beginning was the word in the beginning which was not the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was internally with god and so jesus christ is not an angel or a created being remember what the author of hebrews is trying to do here he's trying to remove his jewish christians from giving high mark, high rank to angels. In the time when the author was writing, some believers were already worshiping angels. Turn to Colossians chapter two, verse 14. Colossians two, 14. Hey. 
in Colossians, it, it just occurred to my, my mind, uh, the, let me, let me make sure that I, I have the correct uh, verse where Paul was trying to correct the Colossians from engaging, look at, uh, yeah, chapter four, yeah, chapter two, all right. Let's begin from verse 16. Therefore, let us let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new creation or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you, verse 18, of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by the fleshly mind. In other words, he's being confused. His mind is confusing him. He's saying that he saw, he saw vision and all kinds of things, and they have entered into the arena of worshiping angels. And so Paul is cautioning the recipient of the letter. And so it was around this period of time, maybe not too far, that the author of Hebrews was also presenting this truth to the recipients, warning them about engaging in giving angels respect that, that is not due to them, that is not due them. Rather, that the respect, honor, glory should be detached from angels and give them to whom that is due, and that is Jesus Christ. And so, in verse 5, for he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But in verse 6, but one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? In as King James Fashion we say, or the son of man that thou art consigned about him. What is man? And he's talking about. This quotation is Psalm 4, verse 8. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 4, verses 8 through 6. Psalm 4, verses 6 through 8, rather. Right Here, David is going to speak of man in application, applying it to our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter four, flip, flip that, flip, uh, flip, uh, flip the passage, Psalm eight, verse four through six. What is man that thou dost take thought of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him? Yea, thou hast made him a little lower than God, and dost crown him with glory and majesty. Literally, you have made him lower than angels. You have made him lower than angels. That word God, the Hebrew word Elohim also applies to angels, as the author of Hebrews correctly identified here in our passage in verse 5, verse 6. But what has in verse, uh, verse 5, for he did not subject to any angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him? or the son of man that thou art consigned about him. Thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels, lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him 
with glory and honor and has appointed him over the works of thy hands thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet what we're looking at here in psalm of david in psalm chapter 8 david filled with the holy spirit was in awe he was totally in awe of the magnificent work of god the 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 the, the all the things that God did, the celestial creation of the Almighty, David in the spirit saw all these things. And he looked at man, very tiny, puny, puny man. He looked at man in respect to all the creation of God. And he wondered, what is man that you, O God, are mindful of him? That should that 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 thought alone should make you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to shudder. What is man? In, in, in just look at the, this creation that God put this gigantic. See this earth that this planet Earth is just a tiny tiny bit of the whole universe that God created. Tiny bit, and yet in spite of all this creation, God created this pony man. Pony you, pony me, and put us on this planet Earth. He didn't just put us on this planet Earth, but he endowed us with glory. Uh, and that's what David is saying here. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, that you have such thought, such concern, so overwhelmed by this little man. In, in, in S where David said that we are nothing but breath, breath. You are God, you breathe. S where he said we are nothing but pile of sand, clay, nothing. And yet God took such care and become so mindful to the point of making us in the image of God. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Not only is God mindful of man, but God has brought everything under the subjection of man. He, all his creation, he placed man to be dominion, to be in authority, to have sovereignty over everything he created. This is totally incredible, totally amazing, totally mind-boggling and breathtaking that you, you, the one made in God's image, has been given such so much to take care of in the name of God. And so David is saying here, as he wonders, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you have such care for him? Don't you ever pop your head? Don't you ever let your head explode? It's so tiny. You should be in awe, in reverence, of the one who places you where you are, or the one who has given you everything that you so enjoy today. What is man that thou art mindful of him? He has crowned him with glory. Now he, he points to Jesus Christ, uh, as, we, as, we, as we will see in a minute. Back to Hebrews chapter two. Again, for he did not subject to angels the world to come. Angels have not been given authority to rule or to be in authority. Uh, to, they have never been given sovereignty. Angels don't have sovereign power. They do not have power to rule anywhere in the, in the world, in the past, in the world to come, in our present world. Angels have not been given any authority to rule. So that eliminates Jesus Christ from being an angel. Anyone who claims that Jesus was an angel, well, the Bible says here he's going to rule. He's under rulership. He's going to rule. He's already. He has already received. He has already been prepared to rule. All he's needing is his kingdom, which is yet future. And so, if that's the case, that erases the idea, the thought that Jesus is an angel or was created 
angelic being. What is mine that thou art mindful of him and that you have such thought that has made him for a little while lower than the angels. Is he man? We are lower than the angelic beings. You know that? If you, even if you don't know that, you know that tonight then, because the Bible says so. We are lower than the angelic beings. Even in the humanity of Jesus Christ was lower than the angelic beings. Yet, when they worship, they worship him. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? They worship him. Why? Because of his dynamic nature. Fully God fully man, joined in one person. He, he, he's different from God in that he is fully man, different from man in that he's fully God, joined in one person, inseparable, united for all eternity. As we see this, as we see this truth, as this truth sinks, we will begin to see the relationship that we have with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Though man, truly man, because he's truly man, that's why he was made lower than the angels. Thou has made him, in verse 7, Hebrews 2 7, thou has made him a little, for a, a little while, lower than the angels. Thou has crowned him with glory and honor and has appointed him over the works of thy hands. When Jesus Christ came into this world, when he came into this world, he came just like we are. He came like us. As we see, uh, look, at, in fact, look at verse 16. We, we come there in verse 14 to 14. Since then, the children share in flesh and blood. He, Jesus himself, Likewise, also partook of the same. Partook of the same, the same what? Flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. That's why he bled. He didn't bleed to death, but that's why he bled. That's why when they, they spared him, the soldiers spared him when they threw the arrow and, and they cut through his flesh. The Bible tells us blood and water gushed out. Why? Truly human. 100% human. He came with the same, the same blood that you have, the same flesh, except that his flesh doesn't have sin nature. Apart from that, he was truly human. He didn't have special flesh. His flesh wasn't a, wasn't a robber. His flesh was not a robber. He didn't have something special about him, his human, human nature. He was physically. And as the Bible has shown us that Jesus Christ, in his human nature, possesses or possessed all the traits of humanity. He was hungry. He was tired. He was, weary, he was uh, hungry and tired and sleepy. He wept. He expressed emotion everything as humans do. And so Jesus, when he came, he came in that nature, walked in that nature. But after his work was over, after he died and was resurrected, God elevated him. God elevated him according to Philippians chapter 2. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians beginning from Philippians chapter 2. Let's just look at verse 6. Who, although he, Jesus Christ, existed in the form of God, Philippians beginning from verse 6, Philippians chapter 2. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. You see it here? He existed in the 
form of God. In other words, he existed as God, point blank. And yet he didn't take that equality. Paul, Paul understood the deity of Jesus Christ. Paul understood clearly the equality of Jesus Christ. He understood that the son was totally equal with the father. That's why he used the word equality. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a born servant, slave, born servant, slave, and being made in the likeness of man, of men. We just saw it in Hebrews 2, 14. And being found in appearance as a man, fully man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, the most horrible death that anybody can taste. That is the death on the cross. It was so horrible, so awful, that the Roman law ruled out completely and totally that no Roman citizen will ever be executed on a cross. That's how inhumane the death of cross was in the time of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, his death on the cross, of course, resurrection followed. Verse 9, therefore, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and on the and under the earth. It hasn't taken place yet. It's still future. But Jesus has been given this privilege. He has been given, he has been promoted. He has been given, he has been given this rank of rulership that in the age to come, every tongue will, be, will confess him. When he means every tongue, he means every who created being. They will acknowledge him. When he, he, he gives you three, three places where he will be acknowledged in heaven, all the created beings, all the beings that occupy the heaven, will bow to the authority and rulership of Jesus Christ. Whereas, whereas would they bow on earth, on this planet earth, every living being will, for the first time, Many have rejected him. Many doesn't want to acknowledge him. But for the first time, every head will, throw down, will be thrown down in recognition of the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. One more place, under the earth. What, is it, what does it mean under the earth? Well, all the, the dead, all those who died, all those who are six feet under, as people always use the, the, the slang six feet on that. That means all those who died will acknowledge that Jesus is God's son. They will bow, but their acknowledgement doesn't bring salvation to them, mark that. But at least they acknowledge, acknowledge they will acknowledge his messiahship. Verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. That's something to look forward to. A glorious time when the whole created being will recognize this one that was made lower than the angels, but in his resurrection, fully incorporated in his deity awaiting the time when god will give him everything that is due him but right now the author of hebrew hebrews is telling us that jesus christ has been prepared for this glorious future he has been prepared for this glorious future verse 7 again thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of the Father, crowned with glory and honor. 
his majesty and has appointed him over the works of thy hands. Right this moment, everything is under the control of our Lord Jesus Christ. He controls everything. He controls history. He controls our destiny. God has designated him to take it charge of our well-being. And mind you, Jesus is the one who cares for you. As one who has your destiny uh, under care, he knows everything, every nook and corner of your well-being. He knows every nook and corner of your life. There isn't anything that is hidden from him. There isn't anything that he doesn't see. Constantly, his eyes are upon you as a child of God. He, the, the, the future is as bright. I mean, you, you, I, I, I still remember vividly a few years ago when, when this magnificent uh, uh, work of God, many of you saw this, the eclipse of the sun. It was so magnificent. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Maybe I don't think it, 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 I will see it again because it doesn't happen oft, often. Very magnificent. In fact, when I saw this, I, I got I got my 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 special glasses to be able to see this this uh, this magnificent work of God. Just watch, watch as this cloud was just going like a speed of light. All of a sudden, in the daylight, it became completely darkness, eclipse of the sun. And what I did, I just didn't know even when it happened. I just, I was, it was at the backyard when I saw it. I just ran into the house. I was the only person in the house. Just fell to the ground and praised the one who created all these things, the magnificent work of God. This is just a tiny bit, tiny bit of what is yet to come. You are in for a surprise. You as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in for a surprise. There are, uh, that's why the author of, the, uh, in fact, Paul himself in 1 Corinthians said that you have not, he has not even entered into any mind what God is preparing for those who love him. He has not even entered not even a midget has entered into the mind of man what God is preparing. Don't let the enemy rob you of what God has for you. Don't let Satan even tamper with the plan that God has set in motion for you. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is so special in God's program. And that's what the author said, what is man that you are mindful of him? Do you know? Do you know as a believer, God could have done everything without you. There isn't anything that would make God to create man. God was not alone. He was not feeling lonely. Uh, mankind perhaps would have been only if all these people who are trying to calculate the time of creation, they are putting it between six, 7,000 years that the earth, this planet earth is around that 7,000 years. They tried to take the time when Adam was, uh, died and they try to figure out the age of adam and they calculate there are people who just don't sleep who like to do just that kind of business now i'm not one of those but they have come let me just put it this way this let me be generous let me be libra for the first time in this game as libra will tell you the eight is 10 years old well that's fine conservatives will tell you maybe 7,000. But let's be Libra. Let's be evangelistic about it. 10,000 years. I, do you mean to tell me that God has only lived for 10,000 years? <laughs> That's a joke. Billions and billions and billions of years God has been in existence. And yet, he was satisfied, self-sufficient with that man. So God didn't have to create you so that he can be fulfilled. God didn't create us so that we, we can keep him company. He has suffered so long alone. No, he's unchangeable. Always there is pleasure in, in his presence 
for all eternity. And yet God chose to bring you into this life. He chose to create you and he chose to give us life. And that's something we must not overlook. And so Jesus has been appointed over the works of God's hands. Right now, he's in control. When you say that Jesus controls history, indeed, he controls history because God has given him history to control. There isn't anything that can happen apart from his control. Nothing slips off of his authoritative hand. Nothing falls off the crack of the mighty hand of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one, is the Lord of history. He controls history. And that's why you shouldn't worry about what's happening. You shouldn't worry about these uh, politicians running around and trying to make things worse for mankind. Hey, don't worry about those things. Pray for them, by the way. Pray for every politician, even if you don't like the politician, because the Bible demanded that. The Bible said, pray for those in authority. In fact, when Paul wrote that, Nero, the worst emperor, was in charge of the empire of Rome. And yet Paul said, pray for him and other people who were in authority. So we should take time to pray for our leaders, even if you don't like their policies, even if you don't like them. If you don't, don't like their policy, pray that God will give them a, direct them to change the policy and, and they be mindful of the sovereign power of God. In verse 8 again, in Hebrews 2, 8, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Right now, everything is under the subjection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is under the subject. Everything, not certain, not some things, few things, everything, including Satan himself. Everything, every created being, everything that you can see and don't even see, they have been put under the authority and subjection of Jesus Christ as he seated at the right hand of the Father. For in subjecting all things to him, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. You see, nothing is left. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. In other, in other words, we, we don't see all these things. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean they have not been subjected to him. But with the eye of faith, with the eye of faith, we walk by faith, not by sight. But with the eye of faith, we know that everything is under his subjection. Everything has been subjected to our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 9, he, he, he nails it by saying, but we do not see, we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. We, we do see him. How do we see him? How do we see him? We see, we see him with the eye of faith. We are with the eye of faith. They were, when he said we do see him, there were people who saw him during the time, the incarnate time of Jesus Christ. There were people who saw him, the disciples, the apostles, they saw him. But for us today, we don't see him. We don't see him personally. We only see him through the eye of faith. But the eye of faith is the channel of the soul to be able to see visible the invisible. As Moses in Hebrews saw the invisible. He didn't see God, but he says invisible. So if you see invisible, how can you see invisible? How can a person see something that is invisible? It's by faith. And we too, we see by faith. Somebody might may read this and say, but we do see him. Uh-uh. It's not saying we see him. Turn to First Peter, chapter one, verse eight. We don't believers no longer see Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ. We no longer see him. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father.
1 Peter 1 8. And though you have not seen him, you, you, you get that? Peter writing to his audience. And though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you got that? You, know, you have not seen him in the past, a few years ago, and you don't see him now. Why is Peter saying this? The reason why Peter can say this is because Jesus Christ, in his resurrected and the glorified body, seated at the right hand of the Father, no longer goes around, moving around, showing people himself in the dream. And remember what Hebrews already told us in Hebrews 1 1. In the past, God spoke through various means. Various means is one of those various means is dreams, which means. God no longer communicates to us through those channels. He communicates to us through his word. Jesus was the last link of God's word. When God received, when Jesus received God's word, he gave it to the disciples and enabled them through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to record everything that he has given man. And so when the author of Hebrew tells us, that we see him, he's talking about the, we see him by faith, the eye the of faith. That's how we see our Lord Jesus Christ. We envision, we envision. We don't know what will all this will be like, but the author of John the apostle tells us when he is revealed, we will be like him. That's what I look forward to. I don't care what this world has to offer. If anything, whatever it offers, great. But I'm not so concerned about what it has to offer. I am so, so concerned. I am so infused my, in my mind of what heaven has to offer. After all, that's where my internal abode, that's where my home is. My home is just this temporary place I put my head. I don't know for how long, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, I finally arrive home. Some of us, it may take you 10 years, two years, one year, you will finally arrive home. We are all journalists. We are all sojourners. We are just passing by. And so we should live as sojourners. Don't live comfortably because you've not arrived. Live as someone who is on a journey. I, I, I can tell you that because I travel all over the world. When I travel, I'm, it's, I'm mindful, wherever I am, whatever hotel that I find myself, maybe the best hotel in the world, I'm mindful that this hotel is not my home. I may say, oh, that's beautiful, that's oh, what are, oh, beautiful, uh, that's it, that's the end of the story. And I always tell people, I have been in every hotel, beginning from, I have been to minus five star hotel to five star hotel. When I mean minus five, I mean minus five. At one point I was in a hotel, I couldn't just, I was just praying for the money to come so that I can change my room. I couldn't even breathe. I used my blanket and cover my head. It was inside the toilet. It was, it was the worst kind of place I've ever been in my life. I went down to the kitchen. It's only five tables and I couldn't eat anything. It was just, I said, God, help me. I've been in every kind, but I'm still not in that hotel. I was I left that hotel two, three years ago. So, uh, so we must live with the attitude and the mind that this is not our destiny. We are still traveling. And so Jesus Christ has been subjected all things have been subjected under him. In verse 9 again, but we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Thank God that he tasted death for all of us. Without that, 
that's one of the reasons why Jesus had to be made lower than the angels. To be made lower than the angels is to be human, to be truly human. And he had to, because angels don't die, couldn't die, will not die, but man does. And so God made man, mankind to be lower, lower level than the angels. And Jesus, for the fact that Jesus died, is a proof fact, a litmus test that he was truly human. Because angels couldn't die, and couldn't suffer death. And so with that preparation, keep in mind what the author of Hebrew is doing here. He's now focusing on the other side of the coin to show us that Jesus is truly human. This magnificent work of God. So let's close with these nine points. Those of you who, write, who love to write. One, Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God. Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God, undiminished deity. This in one person, that's the state Jesus will remain forever. There will never be a time when Jesus will separate and start being God and start, no, this is his nature. From the time of incarnation, the time he put on human nature, the time of virgin birth to the death, to the resurrection, to the present time, Jesus will remain in that state too. He has to be man in order to test death for everyone. He has to be man in order to test death for everyone. Jesus has to be man in order to test death for everyone. Number three, man, listen to this, man is the climax of God's creation. Man is the climax of God's creation. You, you touch the peak of creation. You are not, you are, you are extraordinary being from the hand of God. We are the climax. When, when, when God created man, there, there was, there was, uh, let me put it this way, there was a, a, a loud echo in heaven that God has created an image that reflects him. Let us create man in the image of God. Again, Man is the climax of God's creation. Psalm 4 verse 8. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Number four, God's intention, God's intention was for man to have sovereignty. Over creation. God's intention was for man to have sovereignty over creation. Do you know why God created you? If for no other reason, is that He will put you in authority. He will make you co-ruler with Him. He will allow you to to share in His rulership. You, you and I will not understand what I'm talking about because our mind is so tiny. I don't even comprehend it fully what it means that I will be ruling with God or, or what it means that God created you so that you will rule. When God created Adam and Eve, his intended plan, his original plan was for Adam to dominate and rule over every creature. Turn to Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 28. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, watch very closely, and let them rule, let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own. 
or the image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and till the earth, and subdue it, that's authority, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and every living thing that moves on the earth. God created man, the climax, and puts, us, puts man in authority. But guess what? Man lost that authority when he disobeyed God. With man, that authority was dented. Five, number five, sin caused man to lose sovereignty over creation. Sin caused man to lose sovereignty over creation. The good news is in number six. In Christ. In Christ. In Christ, man regained his lost privilege in Adam. In Christ, man regains his lost privilege in Adam. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6. Turn with me quickly to Revelation 1 6, or you can just listen while I read as our time is drawing near. See, this time flies by so quickly. And he who, and he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God, the Father and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He has made you a king priest. In other words, to be that to have that privilege of kinship, that means there is kingdom to rule. That takes us to number seven. Adam brought death to man. Adam brought death to man. Romans chapter five, verse 12. Adam brought death to man. You see, the, by bringing death to us, we are all enslaved. We are all enslaved. You can't be a slave and be a ruler. You cannot be a slave and also have authority. And that's what the author of Hebrew tells us in chapter, in chapter 2. We are all slaves. Under this slavery, being under this slavery, look at verse 15, Hebrews 2.15, and might deliver, in fact, let's read them together from, from verse 14. Since then, the children share in flesh and blood. He himself, Jesus, likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he, that, listen to that carefully, that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. What, 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 what a relief. In other words, all of us were chained. We were chained under fear uncertainty of what the future holds. Jesus Christ comes along and he used his special hammer and he just wham, the chain falls off. He defeated Satan by defeating death. And so in verse 15, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. We have been under slavery until Jesus conquered death and sets us free. We can say we are free at last. We can say, there's a song that I remember long, free at last, free at last. We can sing that, no problem. Free at last. Why? Because Jesus has set you free. He has broken that bondage. He has broken that chain. He has set you free from fear. And you don't have to fear about death anymore. Death is no longer, death becomes a transition. Death becomes, a, a, a step whereby you jump over the fence of eternity to be with your Lord forever and ever. So you don't fear death anymore. In fact, the people of the old were fearing death. Paul was one of example. Paul was looking forward to death. Paul was not afraid to die. He said, for me to, to live is Christ, to die is profit. He wasn't afraid. He was looking forward 
In fact, when his time came, he said, I can't wait to see him. I have finished the fight. I have fought this battle. I have, I am ready to go. I am being poured like an offering. I am being poured like offering on the altar. My time has, time of departure has come. He was looking forward to it. Why? He was no longer afraid of death. Why? Because Jesus has conquered death. As a believer, you ought not to be fearful about death. Death is a transition. Don't you want to go home? Let me, let me quiz you. There are people who like heaven. Are you one of them? Do you like heaven? Heaven is a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more anxiety, no more homework, no more those things. Heaven is a beautiful place. No taxes, uh, no fighting, no anger, no, no animosity. It's full of pleasure and joy. Ah. Let's take a, let's raise your hand if you want to go tonight. I didn't see any hand, don't worry. I didn't raise my hand either. Why? Because we don't want to go yet. <laughs> I just told you, you like coronavirus over here? You like all this putting these marks? Some people put double marks, triple marks. If you like that, it's just no mask in heaven. But let me just put it this way you are not to fear death. When it comes, and on the other hand, death will not come to you until God signs off. No believer is going anywhere until his time arrives. You can fall from the third story, fourth, fourth story, five story, it doesn't matter. You're not going anywhere until God decides. He decides the time, the man and the place of your death. When he decides, off you go. And no doctor can keep you behind. They can keep you behind like, a, like vegetable. That's all they can do. They can put life support, but you're not, really, you're not truly living. They're just making, you look, making people look like you're living. You're already gone. When God wants you out, you are truly out. And so, again, number seven, Adam brought death to man, Romans 5, 12, through Adam, sin came into the world, through sin, death spread. Number eight, Jesus Christ conquered death, Hebrews 2, 9. He conquered death. He gave us victory over death. Death has no power over a believer. Not anymore. He used to. We were enslaved. Not anymore. The chain of death has been broken. And that is the song. That is the song that will be sung. The resurrection. In, in, in Paul talks about this song. This this song in look, look at the uh, sing sing with me in First Corinthians chapter 15. Sing with me as Paul sung this beautiful song. Of resurrection, First Corinthians 15. If you have time, you can read the the, the entire chapter. But let's let just pick up where Paul began his song. First Corinthians 15, quickly from verse 50. Now I say this, brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die. We shall all be changed, renewed. In a moment, in, a, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this, for this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he encourages them in verse 50, 58. Therefore, my bre beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that we are toy in the Lord is not in vain. Finally, number nine. Number nine. In Christ, in Christ, man will, in the coming age, rule and subdue God's creatures. I look forward to that. I hope you do. Again, number nine. In Christ, man will, in the coming age, man will, in the coming age, rule and subdue God's creatures. Because we are in Christ, we have been restored. We have been given that privilege that Adam once had. So everything has is set in motion to go. It has been restored in Christ. By being in Christ, we're going to share his rulership. Let's look at these two passages as we close. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through 5, 10 through 12. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through Verses 10 through 12. Quickly, it says, For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it internal glory. Internal glory. You got that? Internal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For it is, for if we died with him, certainly we did. That what if ought to be since we died with him, we shall also live with him. It is a first class condition, which means since it's not, it's not doubting if we die. Since you died, you will live with him. Verse 12. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Deny us what? The ability, the power, the privilege to rule with him. Just because you're in Christ doesn't give you everything to rule. You don't say, I'm in Christ. I can't wait for him to, him, for him to show up, then I will rule. No. Your spiritual life will count for eternity. Don't allow the devil to tell you don't worry leave it up do all you can when jesus comes you're gonna rule i'm just here to tell you you'll be disappointed finally revelation chapter 2 verses 26 through 29 let's close with that passage revelation 2 26 through 29 this is jesus speaking to the church at tatara the church at tatara and he who overcomes, in other words, every believer who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. You see it? That dominion, that ruler, that sovereignty has been restored and his future awaiting. Verse 27, and he shall rule them with, with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, do you have an ear? <laughs> we all do. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a serious business. No time to play around. Holy God, we are grateful to you for your love, for your mercies, for your kindness. Thank you for allowing us this privilege to assemble ourselves this evening that we may hear you speak to us. Indeed, you have spoken to us through your word. My prayer is that this word, which came to us, will bear fruit a hundredfold in our lives. 
It is my prayer that we will not just be hearers of your word, but that we will give it a serious thought, a reflection, that it will permeate into our thoughts and thinking and action that we live for your kingdom, glorifying you in all your glory. Thank you so much, Father, for those who tuned in. It is my prayer that your protection will continue to hover our, over them. Keep them safe, going out, coming in. Keep your word burning like fire, like a wildfire in, in our souls until Jesus returns. Keep our hearts knitted in love. Keep our eyes on the prize. Keep us yearning for the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we retire tonight, we ask that you will grant us pleasant rest. Refresh us. When you wake us up in the morning, cause us to be awakened with great joy. And whatever you have to for us, give us the strength, the power, the endurance to accomplish your work to the glory of your holy name. This is my prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.